Praise God. Well, according to that clock, which is an atonomic clock, <laughs> it is now 10 o'clock. <laughs> so why don't we stand up? We're going to pray. We have a special day today. We're going to have a time of worship. Uh, also, you see some reserved seating here. Mary O'Callaghan's family is going to be here momentarily. And uh, we're going to incorporate uh, a great memorial me remembrance for Mary. Those of you who didn't know where you're fixing to. <laughs> and uh, and there will be some good stuff in there just as a, a result of uh, the word of God and our honor of a very precious woman. So let us pray. Father, thank you this morning for your, your, your steadfast love. It's never... Uh, thwarted. There's nothing that can change it, Lord. I just want to thank you this morning that we've uh, awakened into your goodness again, Lord, your, your kindness toward us, so undeserving yet so appreciated. God, we are, we're so grateful this morning. And we've just come to worship you and to bless you, and we welcome your holy presence in this place. We thank you for filling this local church with your goodness and the kindness of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's worship the king. Beautiful. You 
Father, we thank you this morning that we can join in with those who've gone on before us, who in heaven right now, according to the scripture, are worshiping you joyfully, freely. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And God, I thank you this morning that somehow that veil between heaven and earth is a lot thinner than we think. I thank you that they are even peering in on us today. And as we worship you, Lord, you said you inhabit the praises of your people. I thank you for your presence here this morning. God, it is our heart's desire in every way possible to be one with you. Lord, in our thought life, that our thoughts would be your thoughts instead of our own, Lord. We welcome you this morning, Holy Spirit, just to come. Help us today. We, we're so blessed that you care enough to stoop down to where we are and to pick us up this morning. God, you know each one of us right where we are. And we just honor you today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for settling over us now. It's in your beautiful name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You can give the Lord a shout and a clap because he's worth it. Amen. God bless you. Well, you may be seated. Welcome to you today. Such a joy to have you here with us. Such a privilege uh, in the presence of God. Welcome to the O'Callaghan family. So, so nice to see all of you. And... Um, Today's a, a beautiful day for us, for sure, as a local church. We're just really excited to get to not only worship the Lord, but celebrate the dear, precious life of our sister Mary O'Callaghan. Um, yeah, just, just a joy for us. And um, we are going to just do some of our normal church stuff, which would be we're going to receive our offering this morning. And uh, so if you need an envelope for that, and you can lift up your hand. Uh, one of our ushers will be happy to help you. Then I'm going to pray, and you're free to come forward with any tithes and offerings you have. And then we're going to move right into our time of celebration. And uh, I believe you're going to be blessed. Even if you didn't know Mary personally today, uh, before it's over with, you're going to know her some. And you're going to be blessed because of her life. Amen? So, Father, thank you today for just smiling on us as we were just singing. That your face is shining upon us. With a, with a big smile, <laughs> because you love us, Lord. We're so grateful for that. I just pray, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to give this morning, Lord, that you look past all the outward stuff. I know you're staring into us in the inside, Lord. And out of grateful hearts today, we bring our offerings because of all that you've given on our behalf. Lord, it's just a joy to be able to return to you, a very token thing, but it's nonetheless our gift to you, Lord, and to your purpose, to your kingdom. I pray you'd bless it and multiply it for the use of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you're free to come on, bring the Lord your tithes and offerings, and then find your seat again. We got together with Pastor Chris and Pastor Stephen on Thursday to just go in after the presence of God and try to pen lyric and melody. And it's straight from scripture. And it's the heart of the Father over us as his kids. And we're going to sing over you this morning.
I just want to say thanks to the family. <laughs> Thank you for letting us celebrate with you. <laughs> I realize some of you are uh, didn't know this beautiful lady. <laughs> I get that. This is just your local church, and you're here this morning, but um, I think it's important for all of us to understand what church is really supposed to be. It's a family. And in families, we slow down to honor. We slow down to celebrate the good things and the hard things. We go through them together. And uh, we've just chosen here at this local church just not to be a a superficial weekend gathering spot. We want what God intended us to have, and it's family. And I tell you, this lady right here, she was such a part of this family. And we're so grateful. You know, we, early in the year, felt like the Lord spoke to us that this year, 2021, would be a year of discipleship. And discipleship to grow and to learn and to become more like Jesus really that's what discipleship is and uh, one of the great privileges when it comes to learning to be like Jesus is to see those who've modeled something for us you know it's one thing to read about Jesus in the scripture and thank God for the Holy Spirit and him illuminating who Jesus really is but sometimes we need to see Jesus in skin <laughs> and I tell you all of us carry that in a part you know we don't nobody has the whole picture here but Mary carried such a beautiful part so if you're here and you didn't know Mary let me just help you today for a moment before we talk about the details of Mary and just say listen there's something here today as we just take a few moments for you to see Jesus in a beautiful woman's life and then begin to model your own life and mine after her Mary O'Callaghan, right there, that gal. <laughs> that picture is, and we salute you, Mary, for sure. Uh, that's a great picture. That's basically how I remember Mary. Most of the years, that was pretty much how she looked to me. You, your family member would remember her in all different stages. But she was born on July 11th, 1920. She died at over 100 years old, almost 101 years old. July 11th, it's the same birthday of my daughter, Rebecca, who's gone on to be with the Lord. Same July 11th, and I'll never forget when every time that date rolls around every year, obviously I think of my daughter, but I think of Mary. And I'm always going to think of Mary. I'm never going to lose sight of this dear woman. And um, I have a scripture. I just wanted to read it because, you know, I was just pondering her name. Mary, and I was thinking, obviously, of the, of the mother of Jesus' name being Mary. And this particular verse just kind of bubbled up in me, and I think it's fitting today. It'll take me a moment just to explain why, but here it is. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning in verse 34. It's where Mary and Joseph uh, have baby Jesus, and they go up to the temple to fulfill the custom of Moses there the law of Moses, and uh, to, of dedication. And Simeon, who was a very devout man, was there, and he saw them. And it says, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed a sword, Simeon was speaking to Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Why is this scripture important for me when I think about our dear sister Mary O'Callaghan? Because she was a mother, no doubt. Here you see proof of that. <laughs> Uh, she also had something in her 
that would be like Mary, the mother of Jesus, required of her that would be costly and she would be having to lean into some challenging stuff in her hundred years of living. You can only imagine everybody has their ups and downs, but just give me a second and hear this because it's important, I think. Mary's name, the word Mary, it's a Hebrew origin name, and it actually means, now just hang with me, it means rebel, and it means bitterness, like sorrowful bitterness and so on. You think, okay, why would, why would the mother of Jesus be named this way? Was she a rebel? Well, depends on who you're talking to. I mean, truth be known, she, what Simeon just said to her was that she would be used to expose the hearts of people that would be out of the way. People's hearts would be exposed because of the Christ child. He came to confront certain things, right? And that she would also marry bitter, would have to suffer through some things. A sword would go through your own thing as a result of the calling on her life. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I think there's some similarities with this dear sister, Mary. Now, she wasn't a rebel, but that depended on who you talked to. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> she wasn't rebellious in the sense of anti-God or anything. Actually, if, if, if you knew God, you knew this lady was for you and for him, and there was no problems there. But if you were working another agenda or something, uh, you might see her as somebody that would not compromise on what was true. Our dear Mary had to endure some pretty painful things throughout the course of her life, like Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I rejoice to know today that that woman, Mary O'Callaghan, God used her in my own life. I can't tell you how many times and how many ways to, to change ways that I thought about things and saw things. I'll speak to some of that in just a moment. June 14th, 1941. She married the love of her life, Jim O'Callaghan, and she got married on Flag Day. Now, you say, okay, big deal. No, no, you don't understand, because Mary was a staunch, patriotic American. Flag Day and marriage, those seemed like synonymous <laughs> events, you know. I mean, she was not only married to the man, she was married to the covenant of this country, and she knew that this country's covenant was founded on Judeo-Christian principle. So there, hence, was her love for Israel. So she married Jim O'Callaghan on Flag Day. You know, when you think of this nation <coughs> and uh, the principle of, you know, Mary's name, rebellious. <laughs> Some thought this country was formed out of rebellion to the King of England. <laughs> But today, we would say somebody was standing up for freedom and liberty and justice and not to be under the oppression of some kind of other thing. And I just think that idea, is, to me, is a picture of kind of the torch Mary carried in so many ways. She was for liberty and for freedom and for honor and the such. She had six beautiful children. Many of them are here today. And... Uh, not only did she raise them and carry them on her hip as little ones, but she also carried this nation, as I've said, and the nation of Israel on her hip as well. If you knew her everywhere she went, she was saddling a burden for the world and, practically speaking, right here, our country. I had the privilege uh, a couple days back to do a Zoom conference call with some of the, the, the daughters and um, got a couple interesting insights. I always enjoy talking to family and learning things that I didn't know about people that I loved but didn't understand all the dynamics there. But um, I heard different things like this, that Mary raised her children to be independent, right? And the kids felt trusted. Uh, that was a common theme there. They just felt trusted. Uh, you know, they, they just went out in front of them and said, you know what? You're not going to spend your whole life dependent on mom and dad. You're going to learn to get up on your own, and we trust you. And they actually got behind them in getting them to spread their wings and move on out into the world. Daughter Wendy uh, went to college at 16 years old. 
<laughs> Go spread your wings, kiddo. <laughs> but that was kind of their, their philosophy. It was just understood. They didn't hound the kids about getting good grades. They just knew you would get good grades. <laughs> that was just kind of an understood thing. Her daughter, Lori, who described herself, and I don't have to look far to know that she's telling the truth as a kind of a happy-go-lucky <laughs> individual, <clears throat> remembered going through a tough season and uh, when she was being bullied in the local school system some. You know, that happens. It's a very unfortunate and tragic thing when it does, but she was being bullied, and she came home quite upset because of it. And uh, Mary just stopped, paused for a moment, and said, well, you know, my goal was never to raise popular children. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, that certainly uh, describes the heart of Mary O'Callaghan. She wasn't about trying to be popular. She was about trying to do what was right, whatever the cost might be. You weren't going to be pampered, one of them said, but you sure weren't going to be ignored either. Let me just say, let me pause for a second. Disciples <laughs> of Jesus. These are wonderful principles, simple principles. Not being pampered. Sometimes we pamper too much. And we cut ourselves short of our potential because of it. But there's a balance, isn't there? Not pampered, but not ignored. Right? Embraced, but challenged. We need it. Mary got that, her and Jim. And they obviously did a real good job. She lived by these very principles. It's one thing to teach them. It's another thing to do them. Her kids, obviously, it seems obvious to me, understood that this was not only a doctrine she taught, it was a life she lived. Politically, she wasn't trying to be popular. Can I get an amen? If you knew Mary, now listen, I understand politics can get all people all kinds of sideways, but Mary just was going to be true to the way she saw it. How wonderful to be in a country where we're allowed and entitled to have different opinions. It's pretty cool. She raised balanced and even keeled children. Now, I'm not close enough to you guys to say amen to that, but I'm assuming that's the truth. <laughs> you got one hand waving over there. Okay. Yeah. One thing I learned about Mary is that she, she uh, often assumed leadership roles. She would get in a situation and just see how things could be better. And I would assume, that knowing Mary, she would be gracious because she really was a gracious gal. She just was a, had southern, some southern charm in her, and she was a gracious gal. And so I have no doubt she would always uh, do that in a gracious manner. But if things didn't move along, she was going to get involved, roll up her sleeves, and be a part of changing some stuff. And the girls were sharing with me how that was the case with the Girl Scout troop they were involved with. It was kind of going nowhere. It kind of hit a lid, and it was just kind of doing the status quo. And Mary had this, like, there's so much potential here. We could be doing all kinds of stuff. So Mary got involved, and before you knew it, she was leading the charge. And uh, they started taking trips, like way outside the box trips, okay? Raising money, gathering them all up, and going off to really cool places while other girls heard about that troop. And guess what? They wanted to go get in. She was out in front pushing. We experienced that same part of Mary when it came to Israel because Mary got here and she was like, I want to lead the charge for us getting over to Israel. And we went to Israel twice with Mary. Mary went to Israel herself. We don't have the exact number. Somewhere between 14 and 18 times to Israel. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. But you know, that's a part from the point. She went to Israel that many times. She loved the land of Israel. And she actually was in, in, instrumental, like the Girl Scout troop, getting us kind of out of some stuff and into some other things and moving us out forever grateful to our dear sister Mary. She saw how things could be, and she did something about it. Note for a disciple. <laughs> See how something can be and do something about it. 
her daughter Marky had mentioned that uh, her memory of mom and the highlight of her mom was that her mom was just a beautiful, physically beautiful lady. Actually, her friends used to tell her, your mom is so pretty. <laughs> Look at the smile. I mean, this picture is really not doing her justice. Beautiful, beautiful lady. What a great memory to have as a child, you know? Just the smile of your mom. She was, if you knew her, generous. Note to disciple. <laughs> Come on, I'm trying to weave in my pastoral Sunday message and a memorial, but it's the truth. Come on. Generosity is Jesus' likeness. He gave everything. Mary was that woman. She was a generous, generous woman. I, <laughs> I think I mentioned it to, to Wendy. We have a chair, actually, that belonged to Mary. I don't know. What, did, it, did it come from, was it donated to a yard sale? Is that what it was? It was a yard, church yard sale we had here, one, a missions yard sale. Yeah, she donated this chair. Christy fell in love with it. It was this kind of classic old school armchair, and <clears throat> the bottom of it was uh, falling out. Needed a little work, so I got up in there and fixed it all up and whatever. And we just got done moving, most of you know, 20 years of collecting stuff, and we were trying to decide do we keep, do we not keep? And we got to that chair, and it's like, we keep. <laughs> not because it's like the prettiest chair on the planet, but because it's Mary. Yeah, we'll carry that chair right on. <laughs> just because of whose it was. She was generous, and um, <clears throat> everybody found out she was generous, particularly the different ministries that would solicit her funds. As a result, you start getting on mailing list, and the mail starts rolling in. Now, you think you've got mail. On one of her extended trips, uh, Wendy had to go to the post office because she would have her mail held at the post office and whatever. And the postman said, uh, I'm just curious, uh, is she running her own business? They had three bins full of mail. Three bins. Note to disciple. <laughs> See Pastor Eric, he'll help you figure out how to get the mail stuff down. <laughs> if you were here, one of the things you would remember about Mary was what we had monthly. We had something called Israel Sunday. And uh, one of the things Mary, I think, felt at home about in this local church is that though we've done it, you know, in a very imperfect way, it doesn't take long to see our imperfections. But Mary loved the fact that we celebrated the grace and the gifts that each of us carry. We all have a unique grace and a unique gifting. And though that can be a little messy at times, we just decided to um, take the benefit of that above the liability of that and give people space to exercise their gift. Well, Mary's love for Israel was contagious. And I just said, you know, Mary, we need to know more about what's going on in the land of Israel. And she had so much information and mail coming in because she was supporting these ministries that she was just up on like a lot of current stuff. Actually, Mary gave me a video, a VHS that tells you how long this has been. She gave me a video called The Islamic Invasion Before 9-11. Before 9-11. She handed me a video series called The Islamic Invasion, and she said, Pastor, you need to watch this. And I get inundated with so much stuff. People say, you need to read this, you need to watch this, and whatever. But I said, you know what, let me watch this, because Mary, I knew this gal wasn't some flighty. She was an astute woman. She studied things out. She searched them out. So I watched that thing, and when 9-11 happened, I'm telling you, that video was telling that was about to happen. I'm not kidding. That video was saying this country was about to be attacked. That Islam was aggressively moving to dominate the world and had a very specific agenda against the United States and Israel. And sure enough, when that happened, I, I tell you, I started paying a little closer attention when Mary was talking 
after that video because she, again, wasn't just flighty, although she had a lot of information. I'm grateful that she used her gifts. One of her giftings, <coughs> it's not listed in the biblical list of giftings, but she had the gift of continuation. Now, I mean, she was long-winded. <laughs> And so Mary and I used to go back and forth, you know, on Israel Sunday. I'd say, Mary, I started off with, Mary, you got 15 minutes. <laughs> now, note to self, pastor, disciple, note to disciple. <laughs> Should have said five minutes. Because <laughs> five would have been 20. <laughs> you know what I mean? So here was the problem, though, I think, with Mary. She had so much information. She had no idea how to get it all down into 15 minutes. And she would... And so we had a unique relationship, pastor to congregant relationship, because she was like a mother figure on one hand, and yet on the other hand, I knew she was carrying something, and so, and she was so gracious, she goes, did I do okay, you know? <laughs> and so I, I'd, I'd have to be finding ways to say, Mary, it was great, but let me give you some suggestions, you know? You know, leave out some of the details, and we don't need to know what flavor bagel you ate on that trip, okay, or whatever, you know, she would have <laughs> lots of... And uh, just kind of get down to the stuff. But we went back and forth and back and forth. And I tell you, I just am so, so grateful that Mary was willing. I mean, she took it very seriously. Matter of fact, we had her start writing down. If you were here at that time, you would know. I said, Mary, why don't you consider writing down what you're going to talk on each month so that you'll not lose sight of it. Also, it's something we could hand out to people and they could go back and do further research and so on. And so she was so willing, willing to do that. <clears throat> when I first met Mary, here's how that happened. Well, actually, I think I met her probably at an end time handmaidens meeting. She was an end time handmaiden, if you're familiar with Sister Gwen Shaw's ministry, uh, a prayer ministry, intercessory prayer ministry. And I, I met her at one of those meetings and then, um, I knew she was in a tough spot. Her husband was ill. He was, uh, it was a double amputee, was he not? Yeah, I thought that's right. Um, and so Mary was his caregiver. And so she became increasingly homebound. And one day I just, uh, I was burdened for her. She wasn't a part of this congregation at the time. I just knew her and I just felt the burden of the Lord for her. I've been praying for her. And um, I just felt like I should call her and just check on her. No big deal. Just going to see how she's doing. Little did I know that that day, Mary was going, formally going to another church in Jacksonville where she lived. How far is it? 55 minutes to an hour-ish, something like that. So uh, she was a part of another church over there. But little did I know that on that day when I was burdened for her and I decided I was going to call her, that she had woke up that morning and the Lord had spoken to her. She was quite discouraged and she was quite depressed about everything that she was just walking through. That day, the Lord spoke to her and said, your pastor is going to call you today. Hello. I didn't know I was her pastor. I mean, somebody tell me about that, right? She didn't know formally that I was her pastor. But heaven had somehow chosen. And I tell you, I feel so privileged that heaven would have allowed me and my dear wife, Christy, to have that role, one of the great honors of our life. Your pastor's going to call you today. So when I called and just talked to her on the phone, after that call, she decided, well, that settles that. Sit under and be a part of what they're doing. You know, Jesus knew who his were, right? All that the Father has given me, Jesus said, I have lost none. And a lot of times people end up in places where God never connected them and whatever. But Mary knew that that was an important principle. Find out where God wants you and be there to the point that she was willing to make a weekly and sometimes twice a week trek up here an hour away to come worship. And she would drive this big white Cadillac. We called it the white cloud. I mean, come on, you remember the white cloud if you were around here? It was this big white cloud Cadillac, man. And she'd come rolling in all the way from Jacksonville in the white cloud. <laughs> yeah, while 95 was under construction, 
you know, our intercessors, our prayer team had a very special assignment around here. It was like, you know, Christy's mom at that kind of age of life, too, when she was driving, she used to get in her car, and I think Mary probably did the same thing, and she would start off by praying before she ever got down the road, you know. Lord, protect me from others and protect others from me. Here I go, you know. <laughs> She'd launch out and head that way. But that was just Mary, man. She wasn't afraid to pay the price to be where you need to be when God has given you an indication of where that is. That was our dear, dear sister, Mary. As time rolled on, she began to have problems with her eyes. She was constantly having to put drops and stuff in her eyes, and her sight was getting worse, and she was still driving. And I remember she had these big, dark glasses that she'd have to put on sometimes, and she'd, she'd come in. And, you know, as a pastor who, before God, is responsible now, right, I'm thinking, okay, at what point, I know the kids were probably thinking these same questions, you know, at what point do we intervene here and say, Mom, you know, maybe we should think about a different way. So we, we hit a certain juncture where it was questionable whether she should really be on the road. And I just tell you, I want to I wanna salute this congregation. I want to honor this congregation. A team of people, Andy, I believe you were one of them, and a team of people from this congregation decided that we would go, one person would go pick her up, and after the service, another person would drive her back. I commend you guys. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good stuff. I don't know how else to describe that. That's just real stuff, and it's good stuff. And I have no doubt that on those car rides, I never got to do one of them because I'd be here prepping, although I would have loved to have, but I have no doubt that on those car rides that the gift of continuation had free, <laughs> free reign. <laughs> there was probably, you got all the details, including the flavor of the bagels. I actually, I, truth be known, I heard some great testimonies out of those car rides. Isn't it interesting how the real stuff happens as we're laying down our lives and serving each other. Usually the most profound things don't come from a pulpit. They come from lives lived out. And I just think that's a beautiful part of Mary's story. Eventually, even that approach of us driving her back and forth, it became evident because she was aging and her health wouldn't allow as much that it wasn't going to work anymore. And those are tough moments in life. They are. They're just tough moments when things are changing and we're not in control of them. I know the families had to pass through similar realities. Eventually, they could no longer care for her personally. They needed assistance. It happens. It just does. I lived through that with my dad. It's tough stuff when it happens. And um, But you know, Mary's light even in the nursing home where she was, was undeniable and unmistakable. <laughs> undeniable and unmistakable. They used to have people that would come in, like churches that come in and do worship services and so on, and some of the, the care nurses there said, you know, people always enjoy the music, but Mary loved the music. They made a distinction. She would lift her hands. She, You know, I can just... I see Mary because I knew Mary at such a difficult point in life to still be praising God. I will yet be praising him. That was her key to success. You know, she knew that God in all things was worthy to be praised. And I have no doubt that that was such a sweet fragrance to the Lord as well. As to those around her, clearly the nurses were impacted by it. The night before she passed, her family was around her bedside. And they all decided, you know, the hospice nurse had said, it's any time now. You know, like, this, you know, the, the signs were there. She was dying. She was about to pass. And they just decided that the most appropriate way to be there with her was to start singing hymns. Well, they're all coming from some different traditional backgrounds, and they didn't all have the same words and the same stuff, you know, but 
they, they, they did all, you know, you know, hum along if you love Jesus kind of thing, and they just sang hymns four hours later. <laughs> you know, that often happens. Somebody's nearing passing. And uh, same thing when our dear sister Becky Mertz was, was about to pass out of this world. We were there, and they thought now, but hours and hours she was just there. And we were also singing hymns and whatever. And you wonder, you know, are, is our singing keeping them? You know, I, I honestly believe Mary was just torn between two worlds at that moment. That's my personal conviction. She probably was thinking about Jimbo and Jim and her other family, loved ones that have gone on and, and felt the pull of eternal glory. And at the same time, she heard the voices of her kids. <laughs> Can you imagine the reality of that? Which way? Which way? And yet finally, <laughs> in the sovereignty of the Lord, she moved on to her reward. It's tough to let a loved one go. But oh, how wonderful it is to know a life well lived. We salute Mary today. Thank God for the legacy she's left with you guys, her family. I know there's some watching online. God bless you as well. What a rich heritage you have received from the Lord and with a mother or grandmother or whoever she was relationally to you. A rich heritage. So we have a little unexpected something to hand out to the family and there's probably enough for each an individual from each family to have one of these but uh sometime back somebody had came to the church and donated uh jeff and rachel paul donated some wooden crosses from israel made out of olive wood they're actually from bethlehem there's a little red pouch symbolic of the blood of jesus and then a little card in there with a place to write prayer a little prayer list on the back and the Lord's Prayer on the front of it, and they had donated them to the church. And they said they have a neighbor, and their neighbor is a disabled veteran, somebody who obviously loved our country. He's disabled. He's a believer, obviously, and he's just had a burden to do something even in his disabled condition. Local guy, right? And so he buys these crosses from Israel, olive wood crosses, and he distributes them out to whosoever will take them. And uh, the question came to me prior to Easter Sunday that did I want to use them and give them out on Easter Sunday? So I said, well, let me just kind of get before the Lord and see if it's going to fit with what I feel God's got me doing and whatever. And I just could never get a release and a piece about it. And I thought, no, I'm not going to just put those out there randomly. It just didn't seem like the right time. So I decided not to. Well, after Resurrection Sunday came and went, we were now looking at this weekend for Mary and Katie, our dear secretary, said, hey, I had a thought. <laughs> what about Mary? And I thought, hello. These little olive things from Israel who she loved so much, the nation of Israel. So in a moment, we're going to hand those out to the family. You can have them. You do whatever you want with them. Put them somewhere. Um, but I believe it's something from the Lord. It wasn't my idea. I just believe the Lord gave it. And I don't think it's coincidental it came through a, a veteran, somebody who loved this country and loved Israel, obviously. I don't think that's a coincidence. And I think there's something to be said about olive trees. And I'm just going to wind it down here. But I've got to give you this because I think it's such a, an important complementary idea, the olive tree, the olive cross. So here's what the word olive tree, the Hebrew word olive tree means literally. It's es shemen in the Hebrew language, and it literally means the tree of oil. That's what it literally means. It means to shine, right? Now, if you knew Mary, all you gotta do is look at that picture. But this gal shined. Lots of ideas in here to be brilliant. This is what the word olive an olive tree is from. And it was such an integral part of the culture 
of Israel, who Mary loved so much, that it was inseparable. The olive tree, you just, it was Israel. It just meant everything to Israel. The oil it produced for their lamps, they used the oil to anoint sovereigns. Kings were anointed with this oil. It was used for all types of things. Interestingly, our country has on its national seal an olive tree with 13 branches, right? which represent the 13 original colonies and the 13th tribe of Israel, Joseph's Ephraim and Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh. 13 and this nation, which Mary loved, 13, right? And uh, Israel, you could go on and on. I won't take time this morning, but Romans 11 talks about thus Gentiles being grafted into the olive tree, right, of Israel. So the, the, these are things are intertwined. Come on, America, a love for this nation and a love for Israel. You can't get away from the correlation with the olive tree. And I just don't think it's coincidental. You may, it's okay. But I don't think it's coincidental that God just showed up and handed us a bunch of olive tree crosses on the day we were going to celebrate Mary O'Callaghan. Her life lived and so on. So I want to read a scripture and then I want to pray a prayer. And um, the scripture has often comforted me personally, and I know others in this room who've also received comfort from it. But it's the Apostle Paul speaking about those who've passed on. And here's the bottom line. Note to the disciple. We don't need to be sad like others who have no hope. Now, I understand there's a grieving that's natural and right and appropriate, but it's not the same kind of grieving. And some people get lost in grief, swallowed up in grief. But if you're a believer, hear these words. Here's the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep or who have passed on. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, for the Christian, Paul is saying, get a bigger lens. The momentary sadness of the loss of a loved one really doesn't define the end of it all because the Lord is coming again. I won't take the time, but in Revelations 19, we get another picture of the coming of the Lord, which he references here. But Revelations 19, John sees in a vision, he sees Jesus coming riding on a white horse. Okay? He's got a sword on his side. He's got an army behind him riding white horses. And they're coming back to the earth. Now, I don't know if you can be with me on this one, but Mary's coming back in a white Cadillac. I'm just saying. (laughs) And I'm thinking she's going to be right behind Jesus on the horse, but she's going to be driving that thing. No big sunglasses. Maybe she'll have to have sunglasses because it's going to be such a bright day. But, but she's coming. This is the hope. Those who we love and who've gone on before us are coming again. Glory to God. Every time your heart is overwhelmed and you feel sad because of the loss, just remember those words. I'm wondering if we can stand together. And um, I want to speak a blessing over the family. We sang about it already today, but it is Israel's blessing. They were commanded to bless the children of Israel with this blessing. Again, I want to say thank you to you all.
for allowing us to be a part of just remembering such a dear, dear woman. Numbers chapter 6, here's the word of the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you his peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we close with a song? Yes? Come on, worship team, back up here. Uh, not that particular song. Thank you. We're going to try a different one. <laughs> it's a good song, but not that one. And the crosses. Can we get those crosses up here, Katie? We want to give one of those crosses to each of the family members. And then there's about 50 of them total. So, um, you know, each family, if you wanted one, you can have one. And, and if you wanted to grab a couple extras for other family members, feel free to do that. They're, um, there's plenty of them there. Thank you, Netta. However many they want. They have first dibs on them. Just ask them and... <laughs> Praise God. So after this, uh, this time of singing and worship, you're, you're dismissed to slip on out. Bless you.
gone And your word is all I've got I have to believe You still bring water from the rock To satisfy my thirst To love me at my worst And even when I don't remember You remind me of my word I don't trust my way Trading in my thoughts I've laid down everything Cause you're all that I want I've landed on my knees This is the cup you have for me And even when it don't make sense I'm gonna let your spirit be members of our family. We have others who were immune compromised and live far away. We've wondered, because of those things, how to honor our mother's memory and to celebrate her going to be with the Lord. And it seemed so appropriate to come to where she had her home. Um, among all of you, uh, you may not have known her, and yet here you have set a table before us. Uh, you have truly made a banquet. Um, I can't thank you, we can't thank you enough for how you have nourished our souls today and um, your love and your presence here and your sharing of your time have meant so much to us. Um, do you want to say anything? Or? No, I... Just um, over the years, I had an opportunity. I'm from North Carolina, but when I would be down and would drive up with mom and would have an opportunity to visit here um, with her. And so, again, I don't think the same way Wendy does, but I was so glad when she reached out to Pastor Rob and, was, and Christy and was sharing this because it is so very appropriate that this would be the place and the people with whom we get to share this special mem memorial time. And I do, I join in giving my thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>